Chapter 1, November 2045, Monday. The bare cheeks of Patrick Clark's bottom were pressed against the unrolled paper towels on the bed. His jeans and underpants were pushed down to his knees, and he stared upwards, trying to find something interesting on the ceiling. As far as Patrick knew, his genitals were about average in size, shape, and smell. They were not the sort of genitals one would write home about, even if one had the sort of parents who took an interest in that kind of thing. He was average, the socially acceptable cousin of dull. His scrotum was banal, his foreskin was run of the mill, his penis was humdrum. The whole package was uninspiring. This was doubtless why nobody had ever told him to go west and star in porn. <laughs> Is this the lump here? Dr. Scone asked. The young African doctor poked at Patrick's left testicle towards the bottom and on the left hand side. Patrick had discovered that his testicles were not reliable sensory units. They did have a pain sensitivity much more acute than any other part of his body. They were also an excellent thermometer. What Patrick's testicles lacked was the fine sensitivity of his fingers, so when Dr. Scone poked, Patrick had no idea if he was being poked in the right place. Yes, that's it, Patrick said. Dr. Scone did not reply. He continued poking and squeezing first the left and then progressed to inspecting the right. The process took no more than 30 seconds and proved that time was relative. The length of time needed to have another man check you for lumps could not be less than an artist would need to render the scene life-size in an oil painting. Well, there's a lump there, Dr. Scone said. Wait here a moment while I speak to the consultant. Dr. Scone slipped through the curtain surrounding the bed and Patrick heard him leave the room. Casually, and to kill time, Patrick swung his feet. Depending on your perspective, either Patrick's legs were too long for the bed or the bed was too short for Patrick's legs. If someone remarked on it, Patrick felt sure he would apologise. There was definitely a draft. And he'd received no instructions about covering up. Everything he'd been taught about manners said that the time at which you showed your reproductive organs to other people should be carefully controlled. Leaving them dangling there felt like a faux pas waiting to happen. As an occasional gust of cold air toyed with his hair, he considered what kind of person it was that had decided to purchase the unattractive curtains that surrounded the bed and why they had felt it necessary to stamp onto these curtains property of the Western General Hospital. Surely the only person who could appreciate them was the person who bought them. Did this mean that the administrator didn't trust themselves not to give in to base urges at some later date and steal the curtains? Or had the administrator assumed that their own taste was universal, that all who gazed upon these tie-dye monstrosities would desire them beyond reason and self-control? Were these the curtains that launched a thousand ships and burnt the topless towers of Ilium? Any minute now, the armies of Bronze Age Greece would burst into the room, seize the curtains and burn the hospital to the ground, stopping on the way out to point at Patrick's penis and laugh. Because whatever the vases recorded, he felt sure heroes of Greek legend would be fantastically endowed. Patrick then wondered if he was thinking about the curtains to distract himself from the lump. The lump was on what the ancient Romans would have called his sinister testicle. Sinister being the Latin for left. It was very apt. Working in secret to create a fatal cancerous mass sounded like decidedly sinister behaviour. You wouldn't get a dexterous testicle doing something like that. The door of the examination room opened and closed and a moment later Dr. Scone slipped through the curtain, followed by the consultant urologist. Though they hadn't met, the other medical staff had mentioned him to Patrick. The urologist was called Mr. Men, but he looked like the kind of person who wouldn't have a sense of humour about that. Do you mind if I, Mr. Men asked, his long fingers arched like a piano player about to begin a piece. There was no introduction, no hey how are you, no shaking of hands or displaying of identification. A guy walked in, wanted to touch my balls, he seemed to know what he was doing, <laughs> so I let him. I thought he was a doctor. Maybe this was how all those politicians got in trouble. Patrick replied, no, go ahead. Mr. Men, Mr. Men matched the enthusiasm of Dr. Scone's poking and squeezing. Another interminable 30 seconds passed and the prodding moved further up. His index finger poked at Patrick's flabby body and the consultant observed, you're a little overweight. Yes, I am, Patrick replied while peering at the two doctors over the saggy hump of his belly. 
What else was there to say? <laughs> well, there's a lump there, Mr. Men said. By way of explanation, he added, sometimes it spreads to the lymph glands throughout the abdomen, but they're quite deep down and difficult to feel. Uh, all right, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Men withdrew and Patrick pulled up his underpants and jeans. He expected he would be asked to pull them down again at any moment. This was his fifth medical examination and he had lost any sense of hesitancy somewhere around exam number two. Modesty was a habit that came from wearing clothes. If you took them off enough, modesty vanished. In a sense, Patrick had become a very specialist male stripper. He swept the curtain aside and took a seat beside Mr. Men and Dr. Scone. 99% of the time, what shows up on the ultrasound is right. On the ultrasound is right. Mr. Men said, making reference to the two ultrasound scans Patrick had already received. There was no poking involved in the ultrasounds, and Patrick felt nostalgic about them. There's a small chance that it isn't cancer, but we advise that the testicle is removed. Despite its recent sedition, his left testicle had been a solid performer and a valuable part of the team. It felt wrong to cast it off with no regard for its years of service. No gold watch, no pension. No sense of it being put out to a pasture on a special farm where it might run wild and free with other testicles. <laughs> Patrick searched for inspiration. The Marines said, leave no testicle behind. The Bible said, suffer not a sinister testicle to live. Harry Nielsen said, one is the loneliest number <laughs> of testicles. He recalled from the thought of mutilating his body and taking away some sizable portion of what made him a man, although man was a generous description. He had a Y chromosome, of that there could be no doubt, but he'd never put up any shelves or watched a cup final, or adjusted himself in a public place. Should he have been doing that? Did they need to be turned like bird's eggs or they'd go bad? <laughs> Too late to worry about that now. He felt the solid weight of expectation. He had been given sound medical advice that two doctors agreed was not, the, was not only the standard course, but the best course. His emotional response came from a hundred million years ago while the scientific advice was current. Patrick said, all right. David, would you um, tell us a little about the inspiration for this novel, <laughs> please. I, I would. Um, in 2009, towards the end of 2009, I was actually diagnosed, misdiagnosed, it turned out, with uh, testicular cancer. Um, I'd been looking around for an idea for a novel for a while, and uh, it struck me as I was in the waiting room with the monstrous curtains surrounding my bed, uh, sorry, the, the examination room uh, with the monstrous curtains surrounding my bed, that this was the perfect solution. So in fact, as uh, the consultant, as the, the first doctor left to speak to the consultant, I began writing precisely what you read uh, just there. So at that point, um, I was writing singular um, with the belief that I had just been diagnosed with cancer, with testicular cancer. Um, and I wrote the book throughout, um, throughout my period of treatment and uh, all the way through past, uh, happily, the point when I discovered that it was a misdiagnosis. Um, but much of what happens to uh, Patrick Clark, one of the main characters in the book, is my own experience, more or less. Um, you, um, you also underwent surgery and, after they, and then tell you that they've got it wrong? Yes, that's right. Um, there, there's a point in the book where um, Patrick has just been um, in for surgery and uh, he wakes up feeling very groggy and uh, the consultant comes over and says to him, uh, it's definitely cancer and it's worse than we thought it was. Um, at that point in real life, the consultant came over and said, ah, it's, it's possibly not cancer. Now you um, tell me? Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but su surprisingly enough, a lot of people ask if I'm bitter or concerned by, by anything like that. Um, I, I would actually have to say it's, it's the opposite. Um, because it's given me um, mm -hmm. because it's given me the opportunity and the drive. There, nothing concentrates your attention like imminent death. Um, 
there's, it's given me that book. I'm not angry. I'm actually profoundly grateful for, for the whole experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think also that, that, help it, that, write it, that starting to write it and to think it concentrated the mind somewhere else at such a very difficult time? Oh, yes. It was, it was definitely a distraction. Because you've mean, always written. Yes, I have. Um, before I was writing this, I was um, writing. I, I tend to be, um, I lean towards dialogue, um, despite, despite what you've heard there. Um, but I do lean towards dialogue. And so I'd been writing um, scripts, which many people have had the, the honor of rejecting. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'd, I'd finished off a couple of those. And it was um, just after I, I'd uh, done that that I got the, the initial. Uh, mm -hmm. diagnosis there. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the, the book actually, go, Singular, actually goes off into um, some very strange places. Um, when did you know it was science fiction? And when did you know that you were, set, you, you were setting it so far in the future? I think I probably knew right from the beginning. Although the interesting thing is that the book has um, an odd chapter series. There are numbered chapters mm. and there are lettered chapters throughout mm. the book. Because um, the book actually begins with chapter A. Yes. Uh -huh. Chapter A, which this is a little bit difficult and which... unwelcoming, perhaps. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yes, um, chapter one is where Patrick's story starts. Um, in the first draft of the book, there were no lettered chapters in it. Um, I was trying to tell that story from within the main story, but I didn't think that worked terribly well. What happens in the, the letter chapters is what goes on with um, a, a being, an entity, which is created in this virtual world, the singularity, um, and it is their um, emotional response to, to creation, being given life and to trying to seek freedom from within the singularity into the real world, um, whereas uh, Patrick is, is the opposite. He is facing death and mm. thinking about coming into the singularity from the real world. Well, maybe we could talk a little bit more once Mark has read from The Sea Detective about the whole question of writing in a genre.